He never wrote a book, never owned a home. He never traveled extensively. Still today, he's the centerpiece of the human race. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life and died a perfect sacrifice. Not even his enemies could point to a single character flaw. He is worthy of our absolute obedience since he is the only mediator between God and humanity. Stay with us. From the Moody Church in Chicago, this is Running to Win with Dr. Erwin Lutzer, whose clear teaching helps us make it across the finish line. We're in a series on Christ among other gods, showing why Christ is supreme. Today, Dr. Lutzer begins a message on Christ's extraordinary life, a life like none other ever lived. If you had been living in Leipzig, Germany in 1779 and someone would have given you some theater tickets, maybe you could have seen the play entitled Nathan the Wise. It was a play written by Gotthold Lessing. And the reason that that play was somewhat unique is because during the Enlightenment, the idea arose that all the religions of the world can really be united. And the purpose of that play was to try to show that all religions produce morality, and that's what is important, and therefore their differences were negligible. Well, it's not only that Lessing believed that, but he also began what is known today as the quest for the historical Jesus. The idea was that we can't look at the New Testament and believe the miracles because miracles like that aren't happening today. And therefore, in order for us to try to get behind the New Testament to find out what really happened, we have to strip it clean of the miracles and find out what the real Jesus was like. Mind you, the other presupposition, which was clear in those days as it is today among the minds, in the minds of many, is that the real Jesus was only an ordinary man. And therefore, we have to try to find out what the real Jesus was like. As a matter of fact, did you know that liberals who actually approach the New Testament that way tell us that they are doing us a favor? This is the argument. They say, you know, there aren't very many people who believe Christianity anymore because nobody can accept the miracles if we strip the New Testament of miracles. If we reduce Jesus Christ down to our size, why then indeed Christianity will become popular and men and women will believe. The problem, of course, should be very clear to all that by the time you've done that, there is really nothing worth believing. Did you know that these kinds of games are still played today? Right here in the great United States of America, 200 scholars have been meeting for six years to figure out what Jesus Christ really was like and what he really said. And you know how they have voted on their opinions? They all have various little balls, and when a certain saying of Jesus is read, those who think that he probably said it put a red ball into the jar. If they think that it's likely he didn't, but possible that he did, then they put in a pink one. If they think that the disciples made it up, they use a gray one, and if they're absolutely sure that neither Jesus nor his disciples possibly said it, they put a black ball into the jar. And so what they do is they sit there and they put these balls in jars to try to come to a consensus. You know what they're doing? They are really trying to take Christ and to censor him. In fact, what they are trying to do is to make him politically correct. Guess which sayings of Christ receive all the red balls? Oh, all of the ones where he denounces the rich and where he talks about the Good Samaritan. Oh, yes, Jesus said that. But what about the statements regarding redemption or the new birth or salvation? All those statements, speaking rather literally, are blackballed. Obviously, Jesus didn't say that. Now, do you realize how subjective this game has become? It is really up to each person to somehow to look at Christ and to come up with the Jesus that suits his fancy. 
no manuscript evidence for that kind of a Jesus. But nevertheless, that kind of revisionism is going on all the time. The problem is that no matter how far you get behind those manuscripts, no matter how much historical study you do, the problem is that there is always staring at you in the New Testament a very miraculous Christ. And there's not too much that you can do about it except to collapse into subjectivism and make up your own version. Now, when you stop to think of it, when Christ was on earth, he was making some fantastic claims. The Jews always went into the temple. It is there that they met God. It is there where they had their sins forgiven. Now, suddenly this man appears on the scene and begins to offer all of those blessings out on the street. He says, if you believe in me, you have eternal life. I will forgive you. I can speak you clean. So we might expect that in order to back up such awesome claims, he would do miracles. Well, many of you know this is the third in a series of messages entitled Christ Among Other Gods. And today we are looking at the life of Christ, specifically the miracles that he performed that back up his radical claims. Take your Bibles for just a moment and turn to the 12th chapter of the book of Matthew because it is there where Jesus Christ's miracles finally so confronted his culture that they had to give a response, and the response was not very pretty. Matthew chapter 12, verse 22. Then there was brought to him a demon-possessed man who was blind and dumb, and he healed him so that the dumb man spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and began to say, This man cannot be the son of David, can he? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house divided itself against itself shall not stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then shall he 